Hi. Well, Thank, thank you. you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I know I've been trying to get you on the show for, for some time now. I'm <laughs> it's very, very busy. Yeah, yeah, it does. It kind of piles up. And then having uh, been sidelined for a number of months, that really kind of put everything into a long, long wait list. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Were you sick? Yeah, I, I was on the inaugural uh, Alaska Bigfoot cruise. And um, uh, I, I'm it, at my age, as do many men, um, was uh, managing AFib, which included blood thinners, and unfortunately sprang a leak. I must have had an aneurysm or something. My wife and I caught a terrible flu while we were on the ship, and it, it uh, was accompanied with a very violent cough. And they attribute a rupture of one of my abdominal arteries to this violent cough. And I nearly bled to death. <laughs> they barely, I had to be evacuated off by Coast Guard cutter and, and uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, units of blood later, they, they eventually flew me down um, to uh, Bellingham and did a procedure to, to seal the clot or seal the, the bleed. And uh, but by the time they were done, they'd used 15 units of blood. That's that's two and a half people. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm glad you made it through that. Yeah, that's me scary. too. I'm very glad. Scary. <laughs> it was scary. It was very scary. Scary for my wife. She was a real trooper holding holding everything together. And then so basically I was left one, once. I mean, I mean, it devastated. I was in kidney failure. My uh, heart uh, was really traumatized. My uh, liver and pancreas were having problems because of that, and and they, you know, I was uh, was temporarily diabetic, wasn't producing in insulin, and and so it was a real real shock to the system. Totally uh, drained my strength and stamina. I mean, it was amazing. The muscle mass just melted off so fast, and uh, lost a lot of weight. <laughs> which was a a good thing in in uh, you know in the near uh, the near uh, sighted aspect of it, but uh, it was I mean that was back in September. I took a whole semester leave of absence and basically wow. just convalesced and just took it one day at a time. Those first couple of months were were pretty bleak, but uh, you know I'm. <laughs> Are you a hundred percent now? Because you seem fine. I mean, it's not you well, know people have a yeah. stroke; they're going to have a you know speech problems and stuff. Oh right, no, I'm I'm sure. I mean, I do have gaps in the memory a little bit, mm. both of events during, but also a little sometimes a little trouble with recall, uh, noticeably mm. slower than it used to be. So I mean, there was probably some impact there, I, but no, I'm I'm not, but I'm not a hundred percent. I'm I'm still. I've got issues, you know, because that you talk about receiving 15 units of blood. It wasn't like I had a gaping wound and blood was leaking out into the, you know, onto the floor, into a pan. It all ended up in my abdomen. Oh. And I was too weak for them to do another surgery, open surgery to go in and, and, um, uh, cause all this other thing was done with catheters. It was, uh, up, up through the artery. So they, uh, left it and basically your body can resorb the plasma very quickly but you're left with that hematocrit with the red blood cell mass as uh which which you know is a, a hematoma a big clot and um so i was i was dealt uh they said it was about the size of two fists at least back in my retroperitoneal space behind behind the guts in the abdominal uh, against the abdominal body wall. And uh, so they said, you know, your body's just going to have to resorb that like it would any other bruise, except it's going to take a while and it's going to be a shock to your system. A lot of uh, a lot of byproducts and things for a while. And uh, so that's been the challenge. Now they want me to go in. I'm, I'm scheduled here to go in for a follow up for a, uh, another CT and an echocardiogram to see how how the heart's the heart seems to be doing good. They uh, Put me on some new meds that really helped and uh, adjusted some things and so i'm on, on the pharmacological side of it with the exception of you know a lot of these uh, a lot of these medic medications have a side effect of fatigue and muscle sure. weakness and so when you start compounding them <laughs> as they do uh you you get the short end of the stick so that's that's my biggest complaint or concern right now is you know i just 
walking across a football field is a is is an effort now and so i've just got to but they they said i couldn't lift anything over 10 pounds until i had this uh, until they cleared me after this ct the next week so we're right i'm, I'm crossing my fingers that things everything held together well <laughs> wow well that's amazing that that you can uh, recover from this and yeah. it sounds like the doctors did some amazing things i mean Oh, this yeah. goes back to like what I want to talk about, like just science, how science is, is so amazing, the things that they can do. But what are your thoughts on on just the definition of science? Because I feel like it's it's kind of changed. People don't understand. You know, there's all this talk of misinformation or disinformation. Yeah. The scientific approach is exploring and learning from things. And it, I feel like it's never ending. Well, right. And, and sometimes that part, the exploration, the curiosity, the the question stage gets um gets uh, ignored or or soft pedaled or you know even even kind of gets considered uh, not yet scientific and and the emphasis is on the the uh, methodology uh i mean you know you'll hear the scientific mes method uh repeated and um that is a philosophical standard uh, um you know a handrail but in practice the way we experience nature the way we ex uh, and uh, you know everything uh, if we're dealing with the physical science well it's still part of nature we can nature can be far beyond the life sciences but um it uh, the there is uh, a standard uh, to which we strive to to have um reproducibility objectivity and so on quantification uh those things are all important elements but but still it is experiential um but i tell people you know you the, the experience is the start <laughs> right That's the beginning and and i'm not satisfied with just your story your anecdote because there are so many factors so many subjective aspects uh and and that's another dimension of scientific research is the 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 science of of human perception human recall human memory you know as we were just talking about yeah so, um so yeah it's uh I think that that's the most important thing is that you hold yourself to a standard of of objectivity of documentation uh, so that someone else can replicate that experience or experiment uh, or observation uh, if it's just as simple as that without that ability to replicate it remains a personal experience and you know you you're free to interpret it or to internalize it or imbue it with whatever meaning you want because no one else will necessarily have that same and and if it's that unique and individual of a, of an experience it may be the same for them you know right. so that's uh well and explain this um cuz i heard you talking about this this is interesting occam's razor which for people who don't know um uh, i think there's a misconception you're saying because people think that that's you're just looking for the simplest explanation, but you're saying no, you're looking for an exception to the most common explanation. Right, right. So as I said, this this methodological approach is is very philosophically based. It's kind of abstraction, and part of that abstraction, uh, Karl Popper was the the author of this uh, 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 this parsimony. The principle of parsimony is the proper term. Occam's razor. Occam uh, explained it in in a way that um, uh, that earned him that moniker of Occam's razor on the principle. But but basically, what it says is, I mean, well, let me back up. In uh, the philosophical approach, the purest approach to science is that we cannot prove with one hundred percent one hundred percent certainty anything. There, because there's always the opportunity to experience an exception, and uh, uh, you just cannot examine all possible cases, and so your conclusion is of necessity tentative, and and constrained, and so um, the the more efficient way to proceed in hypothesis testing 
is not to look for every single piece of evidence that supports it, but just find that one exception, one exception that disqualifies it. And then you can fall back and huddle and re-examine your hypothesis and modify it accordingly. But what it says is one is not justified in unnecessarily multiplying factors, which means you're not justified in unnecessarily elaborating and creating this convoluted, complicated, extraordinary, seemingly, explanation for, a, for an observation. You're obliged to hypothesize the simplest explanation first, and then try to knock the legs out from underneath that as you proceed along ever more complicated explanations. Well, experience and history has told us, has shown us repeatedly, that usually the generally accepted then explanation eventually for something is not the simplest nature especially in biological systems is very complex and and uh, evolution doesn't follow the shortest distance from a to b because it has no foreknowledge of what b is so it's bouncing around in the current circumstances and we just happen to observe it arrive at b mm -hmm. um in, in, as far as the timing of it goes so when people say, uh, so unfortunately, that Occam's razor has been been sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, see, and here, here's where I have to struggle sometimes to grab those words that used to just roll off my tongue. Um, it's been distorted into uh, the, the commonly recognized saying, the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one. Absolutely false. It's the it's it not it, there's no value judgment there's no there's no prioritization in terms of the probability of correctness it's purely what we a heuristic a, a rhetorical or uh, method of ordering in a logical way the simplest to most complex explanations in order to efficiently um, falsify them and arrive at what is then deemed to be at least in the t for the time being the correct answer yeah so, yeah yeah because I, I mean i read your book where i, I listened to it on a audio book yeah. I, it was at double speed so i might have missed some things but i mean you break this <laughs> stuff down and it's very tactical and and some of the stuff i don't even understand but uh you know when you when you google your name and you look your, your uh, uh uh your name up it says like i mean you're accused of pseudoscience all right what is that what well, i don't well, understand what because well, like, when i read your book it, it yeah. sounds like you're, it's regular science i don't know what's the difference exactly well that's the that's the the kicker that's the funny I irony of it if you turn right around and ask such an an accuser to define pseudoscience they wouldn't be able to do it <laughs> you know there's and and if you try to look up, you'll get either these extremely long, uh, verbose uh, uh, diatribes, uh, treatise on, on this, that, and the other, or you get this kind of well, it's not good science. So it has to do with things like you know, has it been peer reviewed? Is it generally accepted by the uh, by the mainstream? Which is ridiculous. I actually this is this just to illustrate how this can can get a foothold. I served on an ad hoc committee to um, uh, appointed by the faculty senate to revise, review and revise the university's policies on academic freedom. And there were like four or five of us on this committee. And a couple of us were, were, were expressly appointed to the committee by the chair uh, because we were involved in what was perceived as controversial subject matter in, in our research. And so they wanted to include our perspective because we had been the brunt <laughs> of uh, sort of anti-intellectual um, freedom, academic freedom. And so, uh, but as we were putting the pieces together, we had kind of sort of divided and conquered and each of us took kind of a section. And this one uh, member had uh, uh, sort of the summary statements, which she was ready to modify as we submitted our sectional bits but she had done her research and had, had glommed on to a number of things and one of her points right up there near the top was the um uh you know university professors should be teaching that which is generally accepted by the consensus of their discipline and i said what 
<laughs> that's the antithesis of what we're I mean, uh, science is not determined by consensus, by majority vote. And and so to uh, that, that saying that because, you know, I'm one of the few voices who actively um, uh, advocates for the examination of the possible existence of relic hominoids, that I should not have that academic freedom to pursue that or to even mention it from from the lectern because it's not generally accepted by my discipline i said that's ridiculous she was quite embarrassed i mean she had just lifted it from another source which was uh, it was uh, um, addressing what they thought was academic freedom and and you know where where were the boundaries drawn and so uh, yeah to level pseudoscience and yet offer no specifics see they 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 easily cast that label but they don't give examples well some some try to i mean for example in print, you'll see there was one author who denigrated a paper I published, I presented in a in an international symposium, and then it was published in the proceedings of that as a peer-reviewed paper, not just as an, a summary abstract and praises of the presentation. It was the it was a full-blown paper reviewed by five um, uh, anonymous uh, reviewers as well as input from the editors and the symposium organizers and so forth. And it was published in the sponsoring entity of this international symposium, which was the New Mexico Museum of Natural History. And so this was published in their, in their journal, their in-house published journal, the bulletin, which was you know, not just a newsletter or anything. It was a, it was a full blown bona fide journal. And yet, this author, who has no acumen, no credential, no experience in in academia in this regard, says, well, this was kind of seems like an awfully unusual place to publish an important scientific paper. Well, <laughs> important by by whose standard, you know, important by whose expertise. I mean, these were I, I presented this to a room of some 75 of the world experts on tracks and traces of Cenozoic mammals and, um, you know, to a rapt audience who were extremely interested. I had plaster casts out on display on the side of the room in which they were uh, extremely intrigued. And, and, you know, these are people who are expert in the identification and analysis of fossilized footprints of, of various animals. And so, you know, not just a, a crowd of enthusiasts or something. So that's just, I mean, just one example of the of the you know sophomoric pronouncements of these people in the name of oh you're just doing pseudoscience you know it's just I, I always find it's it's an, instead of grappling with the content of the paper and criticizing any any aspect any assertion any proposition any evidence presented no they just step back and it's the principle of of it uh, here's one more I was. Um, you know, in this one, if it, depending on how you want to split hairs, I guess, um, the same people, same reviewers, same organized, so forth, encouraged me that they were so intrigued by this presentation that I, uh, they, they encouraged me to, um, uh, to uh, attach a label, what's called an ichnotaxon. In fact, that's what the published paper eventually was. Um, an ichnotaxon, which is the name of the track or the trace for which there are no known skeletal remains, fossilized remains of the track maker or trace lever. Now, in the case of Sasquatch, we've got a, a potentially living species. And technically, by the bylaws, uh, by the guidelines of this um, of this system of taxonomy, it should only apply to um, extinct uh, forms with fossilized footprints. But this was kind of a special case. And, it, you know, it wasn't at my behest that I participated. I was an invited presenter that was, and I was, uh, you know, energetically encouraged to pursue this um, um, establishment of a gnomon. Because what it does is is it it puts a handle on the data. It 
on the uh, on the the footprints. It establishes a holotype with certain characteristics that that dictate a description and diagnosis that differentiates it from other tracks, other. And in this case, although it wasn't an extinct species, the track maker was unrecognized and hence unknown to science. And so um, they thought this was a, a really interesting special case. And yet there's a real vociferous detractor on, on a particular web website, Facebook uh, page that is, who, um, who just went on and on and on about how ridiculous and he labeled this just as simply pseudoscience and and it violates the 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 uh canon so to speak but does he address the content anywhere no does he does he uh you know counter the statements of the reviewers no you know so it's just he's he's so <laughs> fixated on his uh of his, uh, 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 you know, grasp of the uh, of the rules. Oh, you violated the rule. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you know the elephant. I, I'm ignoring the elephant in the room because there cannot be elephants in this room. Right. It's not allowed. <laughs> yeah, because there is a lot of evidence. Obviously, we'll we'll get to that, and then just you know, obviously, you got to sort through a lot of the other stuff. That's the hoaxes and things. But when we talk about the book, is called Sasquatch. Or a legend of Sasquatch. Is that what it's called? Wait. It's called Sasquatch colon legend meets science. Yeah, okay. Legend meets Sasquatch. So you call this creature Sasquatch in the book, but the, there's other terms. There's Bigfoot and then a Yeti. I think that's more like we're talking about in the snow version. And then the skunk ape, is that more like the South, like Florida version? Well, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of names that have, and uh, well, it's not unfortunate. It's it's a matter of fact. And it's it's actually interesting because what it, it shows how widespread these experiences have been and how regional names have popped up. And uh, I prefer Sasquatch a bit over Bigfoot because Bigfoot had become such a tabloid term uh, and it was not taken seriously as, you know, whereas Sasquatch has deference to, while it's still an Ang anglicized term, it has deference and reference to the Native American traditions of a wild man of the woods figure entity um, skunk ape is just a southern uh, expression that focuses in on on the uh, perceived stench that often accompanies these things i don't think that they stink as a rule but i think they're capable and i discuss in the book in a very biological sense great apes have very well developed axial glands and and uh, that produce a that can, especially in the large males, produce a very musky locker room smell. Gorillas um, uh, have been described uh, emitting this when the male is agitated and defending his his uh, harem and his little family there. Um, Diane Fossey described her first encounter with just this stench that almost bowled her over when the, when the silverback uh, bluff charged her. So there's that. So then there are other names, though. You mentioned Yeti <clears throat> and the misconception, uh, not to put you on the spot, but the misconception that it is a snow creature. Its footprints are often found as it crosses passes, alpine passes in the snow, but it seems to uh, occupy the uh, subtropical, the temperate forests, high elevation uh, forests in the valleys of the Himalayas and Trans Himalaya ranges uh, its footprint is very distinctive in that the, the the few credible examples we have and they are few there are so many things that are attributed to the yeti anything that you can't interpret otherwise must be a yeti and so melted out sublimated distorted prints of other animals a bear for example are frequently um, attributed falsely to the yeti um, there's a version in the Russian Siberian mountains and the Mongolian uh, ranges that um, sounds by its description to be more human-like, <clears throat> not so gigantic in stature, very muscular, covered with hair, but um, attempts to talk to the locals. The locals consider it just a form of backward people, 
sort of the hillbilly's hillbilly, you know, and and it could be a relic Neanderthal or something like a Denisovan, a, a Neanderthal relative. And then you have the little ones down in, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, there have been reports of smaller forms in other places, like in Africa. Um, there is an interesting uh, tradition that doesn't isn't widely publicized. Um, these might be relic Australopithecines, the Homo floresiensis of the island of Flores in Indonesia, recently discovered. Com should have upset the apple cart, and it did briefly. It did briefly. The man, uh, one of the editors, the managing editor, I guess it was at the time, but Henry Gee, uh, for Nature, wrote a editorial and um, talked about the significance of this discovery of this diminutive hominin that survived at least until 50,000 years ago and saying, gee, maybe there's a kernel of truth to the Yeti or to the, to the Sasquatch. Uh, maybe it's time now for cryptozoology to come in out of the cold. <laughs> we should maybe give these, uh, these uh, stories I mean, ignoring the fact that there's so much evidence, that's the thing. Uh, that, yeah. That, yeah. Well, that's why I, I ask you, because there's different terminology. And then, I mean, you yeah. can get into like, what are, what are Sasquatch's pronouns and things? I mean, you right. can really get well, very technical. Yeah. So, um, well, well, and it's, and it's as if just one, one quick thought to in, insert. It's as if science is finally catching up to the, to the phenomenon, because, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we saw human evolution as this, single file procession one species giving rise to another to another now we see that there is a bushy family tree that there were lots of branches and lineages living contemporaneous with one another and that the fossil record has now shown us that, that many of these other parallel branches were uh, persisting until ha had persisted until remarkably recently if not to the present you know, that when you've got something that's supposedly extinct only 50,000 years ago, why is it so outlandish to suggest, hey, the locals have been telling stories about these things um, all along and that, that they live up in the mountains and they're very rare. And, you know, well, now there are places, there are hooks to hang these concepts of other relic populations. See, I can talk to my colleagues about relic hominoids. Uh, as long as I don't drop the word Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Well, and when you talk about, you know, uh, people who uh, believe in this and, and you're Native Americans, I think that's a big piece of it because uh, I think everyone's heard of Jane Goodall, the chimp expert. And she, I think you said that she 100% believes in a Sasquatch, not necessarily due to the scientific evidence, but due to so many stories that she's heard from different tribes and Native Americans who've seen and interacted with one. Right. Right. And and not to dote on words too much, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm often asked, do I believe in Sasquatch? And I'm very, very quick to sort of deflect that and say, no, it's, it's not a, a matter of belief. Now, now, and she used that term, unfortunately, in, I, in my opinion, a little bit loosely. Uh, and she made the comment, I want to believe. She's romantic at heart, you know, and, and that that is one dimension. Every scientist has has that fiber somewhere, you know, I mean, uh, there's, a, there is a lot of romanticism to the pursuit of, of, of knowledge as yet unrevealed. And, uh, but having said that, she's also very um, aware of the evidence of the data. I mean, she provided an endorsement on my book and appears on my book cover, uh, where she discusses her, um, uh, her conviction that there is something to this and cites the experiences with Native Americans as one piece of supporting evidence that there is this tradition, this, this um, cultural tradition that, uh, that bolsters and, and runs parallel to the ongoing revelation of, of more and more information suggesting, you know, it's like one of my predecessors said, something is making these footprints. Yeah. Well, what so it is, you know, I'm not quite sure, but something. Yeah. Well, so when we talk about the evidence, I interview a lot of musicians and mm -hmm. I, and a lot of people say like, oh, like, you know, there's no good music out there. Well, there's a lot of good music, but you've got to yeah. wade through right. all bad music. And I feel like that's the same with this. It's like, yep. there's a lot of evidence, 
but it's like you have to wade through all the bad evidence. So right. some of the other things that people may be seeing, um, obviously the hoaxes, there's a lot of that. But I'll, And some of the stuff is just even so interesting if this is real, because people say, oh, well, some of these creatures could be uh, apes escaped either from the zoo or someone's private yeah. collection, which I yeah. also find fascinating. And then also people say that possibly some of these sightings are, um, what would you call it? like feral humans? Which I yeah. also find fascinating if that's yeah. real. Yeah, yeah. And there's and there certainly is the possibility that that some uh examples, rare examples, can be attributed to those explanations. I mean, down in, in Florida, I mean there's there's documentation of of um uh, apes and monkeys having been either released intentionally because there's you know, an owner, pet owner can't take care of them anymore, or hurricanes that have decimated a zoo and the animals scatter and, and escape into the surrounding countryside. And in places like Florida or eastern Texas, you know, the deep south, Louisiana, there, there are places where these animals probably could survive. Whether they generate a sustainable reproducing population is another question, but they may be at the root of some of these isolated examples. Now, Obviously, a human, a feral human, um, in mo more likely than not, someone under those conditions may be there as a result of um, some mental handicap or deficiency, uh, and and as a result, their behavior may be very unnatural uh, in that sense. But um, but obviously, a description would would be different now. You go back into some of these historical documents, and there's some great books that have culled lots and lots of interesting newspaper accounts and so forth, going way back into the early 1800s. And, and, um, and of course, there they had no word, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding knowledge of the great apes, like gorillas and chimps, was very uh, meager if it existed at all, mm -hmm. especially out in the frontier. And so... Um, if if something like a Sasquatch were encountered, this very anthropomorphic figure, it might be interpreted or described as a wild man. I mean, we talk about this, you know, Sasquatch means wild man of the woods. It doesn't say, are this a gorilla-like entity that walks upright like a man? <laughs> you know, it's just you categorize, you you lump things together that you observe with things that you're familiar and and the resemblance to uh, a person by comparison to all the other woodland creatures um, would be you know very stark and, and impressive to an observer back then and, and as it is now yeah would now would these creatures be do you feel like they'd be nocturnal or mostly nocturnal is that why they're harder to see uh, i mean i know there's some footage of them during the day but would right. they be would they be both or how did that how would that work yeah, I think I think they're very flexible. I think they're very generalized in their diet, in their behavior, in their in their uh, ranging, um, in in that their resources are probably quite dispersed and seasonal. Um, so yes, there uh, for a lot of these things we don't have a lot of hard data. We have uh, the accumulation of a lot of anecdotal data. And so uh, John Green, who was a, a journalist and uh, an enthusiast investigator, but a very, um, very level-headed, feet planted on the ground type of uh, no-nonsense investigator. Yeah. But he attempted to try to gather some of these statistics. And he demonstrated that from the many reports that he was able to assemble, there was about an equal distribution of daytime encounters and nighttime encounters. And he argued then, if you consider humans are much less active at night, humans have a much more restricted field of view at night and, and travel patterns at night, then the fact that there are almost as many sightings at night as there are in the day says that this represents a much larger activity pattern. And so the, the thought is that, yes, they're probably... Uh, largely nocturnal in in their behaviors, but not precluded from um, from uh, being out and about the day. If we compare to something more familiar, like a black bear, when 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 black bear habits are characterized 
you know, by bear biologists, they're kind of what they call crepuscular. They're active in the dawn and the and the dusk hours. But everyone, you know, can attest, just go online, look at YouTube videos. Bears are out and about during the daytime, too, <laughs> on occasion. And so those are the peaks of activity, probably, when they're getting down to business. But but they're out and about, and uh, for one reason or another. And I think the same applies to Sasquatch. And they'd be harder to find because, now, would they live in, like, a cave or something? Like, because... I mean, there's, you never see the bodies. Like, would they, would these be like deep into caves or why well, is that? Yes. Uh, the, the lack of physical remains is obviously one of the biggest uh, 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 roadblocks right now to acknowledging the existence generally. Um, and I, I don't think it's a damning thing itself. It, and it, it, the explanation, you know, may be, um, uh, characterized as apologetic by the the naysayers, by the critics, but it makes perfect sense if you stop and think about it. These are large-bodied apes. They have aspects of an ape natural history, longevity, slow reproduction, slow development and maturation, and so forth. So a, a death in a population, we I estimate, and, and without going into the details of how I arrive at this, it's not just plucked out of the air, and others have arrived at similar figures of about one to 200 black bear for every Sasquatch. And the, it turns out black bear and Sasquatch have remarkably coincident habitat. Not surprising, two large omnivores with, that are capable of eating a wide variety of, of resources out there. And so uh, they require that level of uh, productivity of the forest. And so there's certain habitats that are, that are uh, conducive to support those populations but very different strategies. Black bear are much more numerous. They only live to be maybe 20 years old, 15, 20, 25 at the tops. Uh, whereas Sasquatch being a large bodied ape, if it's, if it's similar to other large bodied apes, 45 to 60 years wouldn't be un unthinkable at all, but reproducing very infrequently. Bears will, once they're mature, will reproduce almost every season. Whereas a, a, a great ape, like an orangutan reproduces every what four, five to seven years. So there's a big space in between because a lot of investment in the early development and maturation of that offspring before the mother can be distracted by the needs of another newborn. So having said that, what does that have to do with, with how many dead Sasquatch? Well, how often does a death occur? I mean, bears much more frequently, and bears are hunted, and that's where you find the carcasses. Um, uh, Dr. Krantz, my uh, predecessor, used to ask audiences, how many of you have ever seen a bear skeleton in the wild that wasn't hit by a car or shot by a rifle? And he, in his tenure of asking that, uh, for, for, by a show of hands, never did he have anyone. I, I don't ask it religiously when this question comes up i'll ask it and in all those times i've had uh two examples two or three examples um of people who found and and in one they were almost certainly shot uh and had died as a result of a, of a hunter right so uh, even a bear skeleton is pretty rare to, to find. yes absolutely yeah is it possible that, that the sasquatch could also be cannibalistic uh cannibalistic after the sasquatch dies maybe the other sasquatch well, eat them so there would be yeah. less evidence right that that question comes up and um again when it comes to addressing those i i fall back to um uh you know a, a contextual establish the context and just like we did with the the death you know we talked about a lot of aspects of the natural history well, talking about the potential for cannibalism or maybe burying their dads. Another one. That well, that's what I was going to say, too. If they're part yeah. human, like maybe they're to that stage where that could be a thing. I mean, they're, yeah. Then, but that even in human prehistory, that came very, very late. Mm. And, and all the controversy now about Homo nilotti intentionally burying these specimens in the cave of bones. I mean, extremely controversial because it does not fit the pattern. Even Neanderthals, it's questioned whether they were intentionally buried or just were interred when cave-ins occurred. So going back to this question, the all the evidence points to Sasquatch being a rather solitary creature. 
in that uh, most sightings, almost all sightings and footprint finds, with the exception of females with offspring, are of solitary individuals. And so it, it seems to parallel that social organization of the orangutan, for example. So an animal like that, I mean, unless an animal has some sense uh, due to uh, illness or you know it's it's feeling decrepit or whatever and vocalizes to attract its conspecifics to it at the time of death i mean that that just invokes the notion of too much ritual for the level of intelligence that that is presumably attributable or evident in these things they don't have any tools they don't have any home base they don't have fire they don't have language they, i mean they have nothing that differentiates homo and especially homo sapiens from the rest of the animal kingdom likewise with cannibalism so one dies well there aren't uh, a troop of sasquatch about to take advantage of that food source and cannibalize and disperse and and uh, get rid of uh, dispose of all of the remains of that creature so uh, more likely that's done by the normal scavengers, the coyotes, the, mm. the back rats, you know, the ravens and magpies and and then the maggots and, and all the other things, all the other um, janitorial service that we find in the forest. And so to to clean up uh, the, yeah. the Nile Six. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, you, you don't have to you really don't have to resort to extraordinary. That's the, the thing. If you just keep in context the extreme rarity and the relative intelligence, you know, not necessarily something bigger than, or uh, more intelligent than a gorilla, maybe a little bit more intelligent, but not much more. I mean, there's a little bit of space between gorillas and early hominins, say like Paranthropus, but it's only, I mean, you could fit it in your 50 cc's of brain matter. And of course, it's more than just volume, obviously. But, but those, that intelligence is usually reflected in the surrounding, in, in in the way in which an animal modifies its environment to suit its needs, and uh, those modifications are 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 I mean, unless you put stock in the teepee structures and the and uh, and other uh, stacked rocks and things like that, um, that's about as far as it goes. Yeah. Well, I had this guy on uh, a few weeks ago, and. Um... You know, I went to like Bible school and stuff, but he was talking about the Anunnaki and I don't remember learning about that. So then I started doing more research and he's got this movie and um, they talk, I mean, he, you know, shows some evidence for the, that there was, used to be these giants roaming the earth, which I thought was just sounded so strange to me, but there is a lot of these articles. It appears yeah. to be more in like the 1920s or something where they find these bones that look like giant human bones and then yeah. later they say no 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 it was uh these are dinosaur bones or these were large ape bones or something is there any connection there do you think some of those bones could have been a sasquatch well sure certainly there's the remote chance of that although the place in which those types of finds were made are, are oftentimes not in the typical habitat at least now that you would assume you know out in the plains in the badlands of South Dakota or whatever, excuse me, but you're right. There's almost without, pardon me, without exception, those are explained as either um, bones of other animals like mammoths. Ma the mammoth femur is often uh, taken, the mammoth skull, uh, because of that nostril, that uh, the, the, the fused nostrils in the center of the forehead where the trunk comes up taken as a cyclops <laughs> because there, there aren't r full enclosed orbits the eyeball is just kind of sitting in, in a little uh, depression there and a little bit of of uh, bone uh, processes and soft tissue surrounding it but or they're outright frauds i mean this was a popular um newspaper sales tactic was oh. to uh, you know use these stories and uh, the Cardiff giant was a very publicized example that has um, been explored historically where, you know, it was it was made out of stone. And so, of course, they had to make up some. some so you idea. don't think that somebody's come like they found something that they weren't supposed to find. And you don't think some government organization or someone is coming in and, and changing the story for the press? No, no. I mean, I've worked in museums. I've I've rifled through 
cabinets and drawers as I was doing research. And, uh, you know, not to say that I've looked everywhere and looked at everything, uh, you know, but I haven't found the warehouse, the Indiana Jones warehouse with the crate <laughs> and the lost art to find in the that. back of it. But well, what I, about, because you talk I, about, um, you know, one of the best ways to look for this would be balloons that, you know, taking hot air balloons and, and roaming the forest and things. Do you think that's what the Chinese were doing? Because they, they found those spy <laughs> balloons. Were they <laughs> looking for something well, like this? They certainly weren't looking for Sasquatch. They were looking for missile silos and counting airplanes on airfields. and Or maybe yeah. both. Listen, in, well, maybe, maybe. And then that would be a real covert operation, I'm sure. But And maybe our government knows, and they were sharing the information with Biden so that that's why he didn't shoot it down until it, hmm. until it had uh, traversed our, our country. So, um no, I mean, I I would do back handsprings if someone came forward with a giant skeleton. And so I, I mean, my pessimism, my doubtfulness should take on more significance to people evaluating and asking these questions. You know, if someone who would really like this to be real uh, says no, I mean, I, I just get fed up with the persistent uh, um, uh, uh, rehearsal of these stories and claims, you know, the red haired giants in Lovelock cave and, and this, that, and the other, uh, and the Smithsonian having this program to get, you know, get rid of these, make them disappear. It's all just hype. It's all just stories. I mean, they had a documentary series in search of giants spent the entire season. I mean, I, I, those who live in glass houses. I mean, I, I didn't name Finding Bigfoot, but but and I didn't having to do with the creative content. But I spent the whole season searching for giants, chasing down these stories, and uh, and at least Finding Bigfoot actually found some evidence of Bigfoot, even though they didn't find Bigfoot. The giant guys, giant hunters, never do, except for things that are ultimately, uh, if not immediately, transparently um, revealed as uh, contrivance or hoax or imagination it's uh you know it's like uh this will this will date me i've used it uh, I've, I've made this comment before but in my day there was a, a hamburger commercial and the little old lady you know they open up the bun and here's right. this quarter size beef patty and that little old lady in, in her now iconic voice where's the beef where's the beef you know i mean i'm just saying show me the beef yeah you know show me the beef show me the money um, if if the, if there is, and and I you know again, I perfectly understand the uh, the reciprocation of that, where um, you know critics of of those of us who are convinced that there is something to this Sasquatch question could say the same thing, but we can show the beef. It's not it's not the final conclusive evidence, and that's part of the problem. I've had I've had this dialogue uh, an exchange with uh, ideological career skeptics uh previously you know i asked them because after they've denigrated everything and poo-pooed this and that you know I, I say to them so what evidence what kind of evidence would would you find worthy of scientific inquiry oh well you know you have to have a body well no i didn't ask what would prove see they jump from a to z and they ignore the rest of the alphabet in between. Uh, we're not quite to Z, obviously. We're not even to X. And, uh, but but we've got a lot of the alphabet along the way. The footprint, I mean, for me, that what drew me in was the footprint evidence. And Yeah, explain the footprints, because you do say, I mean, you said that you brought these footprints to experts who look at this. Now, there are some fakes. Well, I am an expert. That's the, right, that's right. The... <laughs> well, you are, and also all these other ones, too. Well, well, right? And others, yes. Yeah, so yeah. that's that would be peer-reviewed, which is one of the things that's that, right. that you know, they would say. But uh, you know, there was some people that admittedly used fake footprints to, oh, to yeah. trick people. But then you yeah. talk about this in the book, how some of these footprints were found in spots where it would be really difficult to, do, to get up there and to, to, to put the footprints yeah. in these spots. And that's one that's one dimension, one one aspect to bear in mind. I I place much greater priority on the anatomy uh, and the form and the dynamic signatures of the footprint itself, because I point that out simply because a lot of people will bring me a footprint photo 
and it's absolutely 100 human it has all human characteristics mm. but they found it in this remote out of the way place where they would could not imagine anybody walking around barefoot or in the snow you know and and so one you have to take their word for that because that they have no means of documenting that or uh reproducing that but uh you know, and, and you have to rely on their perception of what's remote, and, and that varies tremendously with, with the, uh, you know, those of us who have been in wilderness areas where, if, man, if you broke a leg, you're just out of luck, fella, because the chances there's no reception. Even I mean, even if you have a satellite phone, the chances of getting um, a, a lift out is uh, pretty pretty slim. Whereas someone else, they get down onto a forest service gravel road and that's remote. <laughs> you know, there's no Starbucks on the corner. Right. So it's remote. Anyway, so I, I would much prefer to rely on on the uh, on the uh, prima facie evidence of the footprint itself. And and that that tells the story. I mean, it doesn't matter where you find it, if it walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and eats like a duck and so forth and it's a duck yeah and, well and, and you yeah, yeah you analyze these in the book which to me it gets to it's over my head i mean you get very technical but but what you're saying is that you're able to tell and some of these other experts who do the same thing are able to look at a footprint and tell whether it's been faked whether it's human or ape or other which would potentially be a sasquatch will certainly offer a pretty pretty confident pretty compelling argument one way or the other absolutely you never say never because all that does is challenge the skeptics to try to come up with and there have been some clever hoaxes the hoaxes the overt hoaxes are really few and far between more often than not are the either intentional or giving uh, you know giving the benefit of the doubt for the majority of cases unintentional misidentifications of things bear tracks or human tracks but then there's also this gray area i mean a lot of the examples that you see illustrated on the documentaries and you know when people come to my lab and when i do presentations i mean i'm trying to to make my point with the clearest best examples that are at my disposal and those are rare themselves because the conditions and the circumstances for a, an extremely clear and especially repetitive in a lot in a trackway uh, footprints is is rare, and so you get a lot of things that are ambiguous. They're little more than scuff marks with maybe the hint of a toe or two, and uh, and so unfortunately, you just your ability to make a conclusive argument is this just a misidentification of an artifact that has some remote resemblance. Uh, or is it a poor attempt at a hoaxing, you know, where someone's just trying to gain, garner attention? Or is it a footprint, but just such a vague one that it yeah, it's really isn't that useful uh, other than to bolster this maybe, like as is sometimes the case. I just was dealing with one recently, the witness re, uh, describing all these different things that have been happening and then sending me pictures of, of footprints that taken by themselves are pretty, uh, you know, it's just not not too convincing the footprints. And so in their mind, the footprints corroborate and bolster what they're experiencing. Wow. For me though, I'm relying on the footprints sure. to corroborate, you know, good compelling footprints to corroborate their subjective storytelling, uh, which may be true, but I have no way. It's 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 their personal experience. Right. I have no other way other than to or examine the uh yeah but what about too the the hair samples in this part oh. I, I was maybe a little bit misunderstood in the book because i mean it sounded like that that when you analyze the dna this was it was you crossed off the list of bear or elk or other ape so you've identified a new species or is it just that it's not a comprehensive enough test to to know well we're we're faced with this the the hair which has uh uh uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Henner Fehrenbach, who, who kind of took the question of the hair by the horns, the bull by that bull by its horns, and uh, he was the lead. Uh, he was a professional microscopist and and had educated himself, a PhD, and, and capable of educating himself in 
the identification of different hair and availed himself of the various atlases and so forth. But there was a consistent, repetitive appearance of a morphology, which he labeled the gold standard, that it was primate in character. It, it wasn't the typical kinds of guard hair you have with uh, larger fur-bearing mammals. Uh, it was uh, parallel-sided, blunt-tip-wearing. It had uh, a lack of a cellular medulla. It was fairly fine, 65 microns, which is about average for people hair, human hair, um, and, and so on. Um, and so, yes, based on that microscopic anatomy, I mean, I'm foremost an anatomist, so I put a great deal of stock in my ability to see and, um, uh, you know, categorize anatomy in front of me. Uh, but but there are others who are not so confident, and they want to rely on DNA. Unfortunately, one of the um, those characteristics I enumerated, the lack of a cellular medulla, means that there's precious little cellular material other than uh, uh, extracellular protein, keratin, in the hair shaft, which makes it challenging. There's no mitochondria. There's no remains of nuclei of cells where the fragments of DNA would be sequestered. So a hair that is shed without an actively growing root or a tag of skin from the scalp attached to it is darn difficult to get DNA from. On those rare occasions where DNA has been identified and examined in a rather superficial way, a cursory way, a small subset of a gene or a single mitochondrial gene, invariably it comes back as human. Hmm. Well, we probably share at least 98, 99%, if not more, identical DNA with the Sasquatch. It's that potentially closely related to us. If it is an early hominin, like a paranthropus, or, you know, uh, more closely related than, than a gorilla or a chimp, potentially, and so it's, it wouldn't be surprising that if you just take one little sample of DNA, it's going to look like human. And so, therefore, the simplest explanation for that observation is it's human. Well, you could test your parsimonious conclusion by sampling more or by, you know, considering the other possibility that it's that it is um uh, that there are other genetic factors in play that have influenced the the appearance of the mitochondria, some uh, genetic introgression through potentially with crosses with humans, rare though they might be. That's a whole other story, and not to not to substantiate the claims of uh, of some uh, that have gone before and made very outlandish claims resulting uh, or uh, uh, extending from that argument, but. So that's that's the challenge. We there is, to my knowledge, uh, not, no DNA sample out there that we can say, well, yes, we're confident, absolutely confident, this is Sasquatch DNA. We may have done it unwittingly, but just it hasn't provided any new information to um, substantiate that claim that it is novel, that it is a new species, that uh, it is Sasquatch rather than human. Yeah. So it's we've good. got the the footprints, we've got some of the hair samples and then obviously we talked about the uh the the tribes that have seen uh Sasquatch, but also what I found interesting was that there's actually a lot of eyewitness accounts from park rangers at Yellowstone, but yeah. they don't report it because <clears throat> they don't want to get uh, chastised. Right. Right. I mean that's that's always kind of been understood as a very real possibility is that, you know, people uh, uh, you know, especially people who are like aware of, of, of what I've gone through in my professional career. But uh, I've worked closely with people who in turn work closely with those rangers and other organizations like the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles out of Lander, Wyoming, who have people out in the Wind River Range and in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem extensively on, on training um, uh uh, treks, hikes, campouts, and so forth. Um, they actually receive instructions not to document any encounters. <laughs> and and you know you wonder, well, is this some conspiracy, some censorship? I think it's just it's just conservatism. They don't want their program and their staff to be 
questioned or challenged or you know or doubted their their veracity uh and uh not so much their you know their career threatened but a ranger a park ranger might consider that a potential um my my colleague and good friend john Mainzinski had a very chilling uh, uh reprimand from a superior who basically said if i see any mention of this in the press if i see any uh indications that you're using time or resources um you're fired on the spot and not only you but you and you and you, there were three people in in the meeting and it wasn't because i mean it was clear based on attitudes of previous supervisors and subsequent this was not a policy this was a personal um a personal uh, concern or fear uh this individual was protecting their own reputation, the reputation of their department, but uh, because of, of the potential for questions about how public funds were being utilized. But it's it was that, and, and I've, I've experienced that, where, where it's purely about reputation. It's purely about, you know, they, they do not want their name associated with this. When, when uh, we had, we've gone through a couple of university presidents during my my uh, tenure here and when one arrived it happened to coincide with our natural history museum on campus the state museum of natural history um was running a bigfoot exhibit it started off intending to be just a six month short-term exhibit and they were very they danced around the subject and incorporated all kinds of carl sagan and michael Shermer quotes and uh baloney detection kits and so forth we had a back and forth i i was excluded from the development committee even though it was um you know i'd played a role in in its um inception but but in any case part of the of the advertising there was this gigantic you know all-weather banner of a sasquatch uh one of the poses of patty from the film and and the the uh logo or the the uh, verbiage said sasquatch how do we know big question mark and and they had tried to part, part of the theme of the of the uh, exhibit was epistemological you know how do we come to know what's the difference between science and faith and religion and and culture and so forth it was kind of an interesting approach it was i mean and that's how they sort of deflected the the naysayers but here this new president arrives, and this is on one of the prominent buildings right as you come into the main parking lot, this giant picture of a Sasquatch. And uh, uh, he just was was quoted as saying he saw that and he said, never again on this campus. <laughs> oh. Never again. You know, w without any knowledge of what it was about, without any knowledge of the subject matter and or uh, it, the... Uh, the evidence for or against it was purely the perception oh. this is the university where that that crackpot meldrum has tenure <laughs> well and so we talk about stories we talk about footprints we talk about hair and then there is some video evidence and i i think to me some of the more recent ones are more compelling like uh what do you think about the stacy brown and his son i think they saw i think this was in florida yeah. Or down yeah. south, and it was like a night vision. And it was actually a thermal, thermal, thermal. vision. Thermal, okay. Yeah, yeah. Switch, which is even better because it, uh, you know, it gives a heat signature. It, it has some. You have a sense a, a person in clothing appears much different than a, a figure that is devoid of clothing and has a uniform heat signature, uh, whether it's at all masked by body hair or not, and it can. If, if the body hair is substantial or the fur is substantial. First time I looked through a very early model, a uh, very uh, clunky um, liquid nitrogen kind of uh, cooled uh, receptor, um, the, uh, or not receptor, there's a different term, uh, but in any case, um, we were looking at our llamas. We had pack llamas to help us with our gear. And it was so funny because you could see the ears and the eyes 
and the nose, you know, and the tongue when it when it came out. But and you could see where the back was shaved for the the panniers and the saddle gear and and the legs but the rest of it all covered with this dense llama wool was invisible to the camera oh. and uh and then you know if a person walked over if they had a because uh, it, it was quite cool at night you had like a, a a parka a puffer jacket or something um you know you could see the face and the head but then all of a sudden the torso disappeared it was just it was that sensitive to differences in in the heat anyway uh, so it, coming back to Stacy's, it, it's impressive to me, uh, regardless of, and, and they did do some attempts at estimating the size and the speed and step length and so forth. But the fact that it's, it, it appears that whatever it is, is unclothed, completely unclothed, uh, is, is, you know, worthy of note. I mean, there are intrepid hoaxers who would be willing to <laughs> dock their clothes and and uh, strut around even at night in the chill of night but uh, yeah those are those are interesting they i mean i think they're certainly worthy obviously this that kind of data is not conclusive see we've got the patterson gimlin film that set the bar of clarity visibility duration so high and yet we're still 55 plus years later arguing about it that everything else that comes in down here there may be some really intriguing bits and pieces and 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 i what i find interesting is when you start lining some of these things up there's remarkable consistencies that subtle sometimes subtle uh that appear in maybe not all but in enough and there's overlapping distributions of different characteristics that you know the way the hand is held the appearance of the palm the set of the head on the on the shoulders with the massive trapezius muscle and that forward lean and uh you know arm proportions and so forth big massive muscular arms swinging all, all these little subtleties some some not so subtle but um that you have to you have to wonder most yeah. of the, most of the uh, uh blatant hoaxes like the guy sitting on the on the mountainside in the golden grass in his copper colored uh, costume oh was that that was the couple on the colorado train yeah yeah that was a hoax oh yeah absolutely Th those are so transparent i mean because you can go right to the internet and and uh download an image of the very costume off the shelf that they're wearing and and the fake you know rubber face and it's no coincidence that in that region and i don't know exactly where the train line runs i didn't go into it then it's not worth my time because it's clearly a hoax right but there is a a company sasquatch rv camping uh company that sell sell uh recreational vehicles and so forth and their logo is sasquatch and they uh, have guess what one of those copper colored uh, golden colored costumes and they use it in their advertising so it was obviously one of their or someone who borrowed the costume just drumming up publicity because in the process of examining it and exploring it people are going to find their website and it gets them all kinds of clicks and all kinds of shares and <laughs> it's what about this other one that i saw was, was, this other one was more recent too it was like a man down south and he's filming the guy or the sasquatch i think and the, the sasquatch is like kind of digging through a tree yeah. was yep. that one real or was that a hoax that's well i had hopes for that one i mean i i, I was intrigued by it because yeah of the Intriguing. impression it gave you, 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 that view from behind, it looked like a big back and head of a gorilla. If you've ever seen, you know, a gorilla from that perspective, but then all of a sudden it stands up and there's these long, relatively long legs. Um, it was filmed by and posted by a guy named Josh Highcliffe. Turns yeah. out that name, Josh Highcliffe, is the name of a character in a movie about a guy in the south who has a run in with sasquatch apparently it was the film has been released twice so it was re released coincident with the airing of this movie and then after a while you know i guess to either to drum up more interest in the movie again or to just try to squeeze a little blood out of the turnip and and uh exploit that interesting piece of footage they released it again and it ha it made the rounds all over again and there have been some interesting analysis. Thinker Thunker is 
is very optimistic because he he shows a little analysis of the uh, the size of an adult um, uh, cypress tree and how big it is, uh, suggesting that this creature, when compared to models standing in front of the of the cypress tree that he compares it to, um, you know, it's a good head and shoulders taller. It would seem that's you know a little bit loose loose analysis it's not real real uh stringent and so I, I don't think i think all the other circumstances make it pretty clear unfortunately that it's another hoax okay which so, ones are yeah. which ones recent more recently have you seen that you thought could be real not many that's the problem and i've, I've been doing some uh interviews some ongoing interviews evaluating things that uh have been pulled off of the internet and uh, time after time after time, it's pretty clear that they're they're hoaxes. When you dig into the circumstances, when when you first look at what's on the screen, you know, and look for straight edges or hems or seams. I mean, sometimes you slow things down, and all of a sudden you'll see the cuff of the costume come up, and there's the there's the sports sock and the sneaker underneath, you know. It's uh, the the their giveaways just like it's like that scene in uh, Six Million Dollar Man and the Bigfoot uh, when they were wrestling and they go tumbling down the hillside and and the Sasquatch's shirt comes up and you can <laughs> see the small of his back and I can't remember if you can see his underwear or his t-shirt but they didn't edit it out it, it's in there if you want uh -huh. if you look for it anyway you, you find those things and they're they're very clear and. Uh, there's because, just there's a lot. Yeah, there's probably it's, it's probably hard to see this thing and catch it because it's probably a very good senses where if it hears humans, I'm assuming it's going to be afraid of us and it'll be long gone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the um, most of the snippets that have some potential or are so ambiguous that you can't tell, uh, they are not captured intentionally, just as. Most sightings are not intentional encounters. They're purely happenstance. They're photo bombs. Someone's taking a picture. You know, the funny ones are like they're taking a picture of a family group out in the forest after the picnic. And then right there on the hillside, all of a sudden this rock stands up and walks up over the ridge. You know, it's like, it's like, what was that? And they don't even notice it until, of course, much later. And then what was that? Um, so, yeah, we're, you know, we're left with just a handful um, some of the best are like the Patterson Gimlin film, like the Freeman footage still, I think has, uh, a lot of very good potential, very, very optimistic about it. Um, the, the, another one that was featured in my book was the Memorial day footage. And that has some interest. And I had, uh, even since writing the book, I had the opportunity to go to that site uh for a documentary shoot along with the mr and mrs pate the videographers the witnesses and uh you know literally spend the whole day there talking with them um shooting the interviews but then having a chance to walk up and down that hillside see what was on the other side of the ridge where did it come from where was it why was it so intent on bolting across that open space to get to the opposite tree line and uh, it all made sense uh, it, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that that was a, a young, probably a, a either a sub adult or a small female with an infant on her back. And it eventually climbed up onto her shoulders and its head sitting right on top of hers as they go walking into the forest and you go down and, and, and where they were running was not just haphazard. It is a well established game trail, uh, probably elk. Uh, uh, from the sign that I could see, frequent that, and and when you go down across that hillside and, and over to the tree line, it just there's opens up. There's a little kind of tunnel through the trees, a little uh, alley byway, and you and it goes over a little notch in the ridge line there that can be kind of rugged and craggy. And from the edge of that, you can we're, you're up in north central Washington. And right on the edge of what's the biggest inland temperate rainforest in North America. And uh, from that, that ridge, you could look up out across there and see just ridge line after ridge line of densely forested uh, habitat all the way up to the 
through to the Canadian Rockies. So you think that is the best spot? If I was gonna go like camping and have the what's the best place I could go that I have the best oh, yeah. of Sasquatch? Well, we mentioned earlier this demonstrated coincidence of bear and Sasquatch habitat. So I'd use that kind of as a thumbnail or as, or as a, a a rule of thumb, I meant to say. Um, you know, if if there are bear in a in a region, there's a chance that there could be Sasquatch as well. Not a guarantee, of course, because again, we're talking about a numbers game. You know, I started to use that uh, one to two hundred to one. So, like here in Idaho, Idaho is not well publicized, not a lot of reports. But part of that is because there are there is such uh, extensive wilderness areas. There's a lot of areas that very few people ever go now. Um, it's not like back in the '70s when uh, backpacking was all the rage. It's it's less so now. There are diehard backpackers, no no doubt, but the general populace, one, they're just not in the shape to do it like they were 40 or 50 years ago. Um, but in Idaho, 35,000 black bear versus, I estimate, if you use that rule of thumb, you know, 150 to 300 Sasquatch. So, um, you know, you might ask the question first, where where might I go and camp and have a good chance of seeing a bear or mm. even finding bear sign? Okay. And then but that's why there's so many sightings in Yellowstone then. Well, no, no, and there and there aren't that many. There there are more than people had thought, but there aren't that many. I don't don't want to say that because Yellowstone actually is. I mean, there are a lot of bear, yes, but Yellowstone people have a, 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 a sometimes a skewed impression of Yellowstone. Much of the habitat in Yellowstone is very mosaic and ranges from sagebrush steppe to very dense, you know, on, on the windward side where lots of rain and snow accumulate on the peaks and so forth. Then, then you get dense Douglas fir forest and spruce and so forth. But it's patchy. It's patchy. It's not just one huge park of Smoky Bear Forest, you know. It's not uh, that at all. And and there was extensive burning. A lot of those now are overgrown with extremely dense secondary growth where, you know, that, that initial recovery makes for um, very difficult habitat for a animals even to get around in, for deer to forage in. It's not until those trees get bigger and some of the, the, the taller, the lodgepole pine and whatnot fill in and start to uh, shade out some of the... Uh, other trees, smaller seedling. Anyway, don't mean to wax and up, but um, uh, I, I then, after considering bear, then consider the history. You know, do some research. Where, where have there been reports? And uh, those may have been, well, I mean, obviously it's skewed by the presence of people. You have to have a human and a Sasquatch in order for there to be a, an encounter. And the human has to be inclined to make a report to an to a society, to a group, to a web page. Uh, but finding those um, on the map will at least give you some idea. Maybe it doesn't indicate the core, the most likely place, but it might uh, bracket the place that is the best habitat, but just few people ever venture into there. You know, it's kind of kind of like that. Um, I, well, I won't give you a, a lengthy example, but but we have examples where that's actually not just me shooting from the hip, but we have demonstrated, um, well, demonstrated half of the argument, demonstrated uh, here, real real short, using using the location data from these reports, um, a colleague who was a GIS tech took those pinpointed areas with a spectrographic map that characterizes the habitat based on on you know literally the spectrographic emissions that of which are influenced by the geology and the forest cover and so forth and in order to kind of get an average since, since the placement of the pin isn't that precise really nor nor should it be he takes an area a cloud of pixels around that point and averages that and and comes up with a composite signature for potential Bigfoot habitat based on 
the sightings, especially if he can show that there's rather consistency across these sightings. Well, then the next step addresses this uh, confounding factor of dependence on a human witness. And he looks at the distribution of that signature across the map, regardless of whether there are reports or not. Well, one of these exercises was done uh, out of curiosity in, in northern Oregon, uh, straddling the Cascades, and there's a wilderness area there. And there were reports around the fringe, which had these consistent signatures. But in addition, the entire wilderness area was characterized by that signature pattern. But so few people ever venture into there. There were never any reports of Sasquatch coming from there. Okay. But that's probably a great refugia, a great, you know, habitat. For, okay. Yeah, there you go. Northern Oregon's beautiful, too. Yeah. I'm oh, from, yeah. Yeah. In the yeah. shadow of Mount Hood and yeah. yeah. All that stuff. Well, I wanted to ask you, too, before I let you go, because I found it so fascinating, um, you know, doing my research, listening to a few interviews that you've done. You actually got to be interviewed by Joe Rogan, which I think is really cool because I, I love Joe Rogan personally. I know some people don't like him, but what was that like being uh, hanging out with him? Because this was a while ago. It was like, I don't know, 11 years ago. And he yeah. was more kind of goofy in the interview. I felt like he was, they, they were, they were bringing up drugs a lot and stuff. It was yeah. kind of, but it was still interesting. He, he's still very smart and he had the curiosity of this topic. Right. Yes. On, on all those, th all those points. And I didn't, unfortunately, I did not have the chance to really hang out with him. I mean, he arrives at the set and, and leaves pretty, pretty uh, abruptly. I was flown in and flown home on the same day. So it was picked up at the airport. Limo takes me to the studio of sorts and uh, interviews conducted. Limo's waiting for me, takes me back to the airport and I catch my plane just nick of time. Uh, making our way through the LA traffic at that time later later afternoon. But you're right about him. He, you know, I was forewarned that he was probably going to bring up the Patterson Gimlin film, and he had a very negative opinion of the film. And uh, so we, you know, I just my attitude was I was, you know, <laughs> I was going to be the reed that would bend in the wind. And so when he got a little more aggressive, I would just acknowledge and so forth, but agree to disagree. And I would offer a counterpoint. What was interesting was his, his sidekick. I can't remember now the, the Duncan Trussell. I could have been, I honestly just yeah. can't remember. He ended up being, uh, backing me up in the, in the <laughs> points that I was making over and over and over again. And, and so it was kind of two against, against one, not that he couldn't hold his own, obviously, but, um, uh, <laughs> you're right. He was very, thoughtful in his questions and comments and for the most part not too opinionated i mean it was his opinions were based on good arguments for the most part and uh it was it was a fun experience yeah it was yeah. fun yeah i think you should go back on that show i feel like that was such yeah. a long time and that was not even technically the real but it was like the joke <laughs> rogan questions everything and so yeah it's yeah. odd only but yeah like that would yeah, be very, you've done very... some great interviews we've been on the history channel and stuff and oh i know yeah that's, that's good for your uh your research right Oh sure. I mean, any exposure that that uh, presents the subject is worthy of, of of objective, rational discussion and debate um, is is good exposure. I mean, that's that's what it's about. I'm not trying to convince people that Sasquatch exists. I'm trying to convince them that the uh, the question merits our attention, and and Absolutely. that in the face of so much evidence, is very irresponsible. Very very disingenuous to simply as a scientist or as, as a thinking person turn your back on it and draw a conclusion that's an emotional one or an irrational one rather than uh than inform yourself and and consider it uh is there a um collection of eyewitness account like i have this book here um somewhere in the skies and it's this guy i had on my podcast ryan sprague and it's it's all about uh, UFO and alien eyewitness accounts. It's just like a, a collection of, is there a, a book like that for Sasquatch with just all the stories and eyewitness accounts of people? Well, uh, not so much just as, as a strict archive of, of uh, narratives like that. I mean, there are some, there are regional um, treatments that are very good. For example, here in Idaho, there's a an author, Becky Cook, who, who has, she's great at collecting 
um, stories and people's experiences. And then she'll put them together. And she's got like three or four installments now. Bigfoot lives in Idaho. Bigfoot still lives in Idaho and so on. Um, and they're very regional, of regional interest. I mean, other books are punctuated. I mean, a great introduction besides my book, obviously, but um, if you're, especially if you're visually inclined, Chris Murphy's book published by Hancock House, uh, Meet the Sasquatch, or uh, its sequel was Know the Sasquatch, which is a revised edition, but it takes you through the history, introduces you to the investigators, the researchers, the scientists who's, who have uh, um, uh, voiced their opinions, their conclusions, good photographs of, of footprint examples, and uh, it, it's a great introduction. I, I would highly recommend that. And there are many others. You have to be careful. I mean, obviously, uh, in the past 10 years, the titles have proliferated extraordinarily, especially in the age of self-publication. There are things that are not worthy, perhaps, of your time or attention, especially at least not high priority. And likewise, I would caution, there are numerous, sometimes very glitzy, um, skeptical treatments that have just proliferated mm. that you need to take with a huge grain of salt. Check the reviews. Check my reviews. Um, my sort, my uh, online journal is... Um, uh, which I shouldn't say my, I edit an online journal, the Relic Hominoid Inquiry. You can Google that and find it very readily. It's hosted on the ISU server, has a board of editors uh, as well. It's not just me. It's not my, as one person recently said, my vanity piece. Um, it's not that at all. But one of the things that uh, is a very important element of that journal are very in-depth essay style book reviews that really get to the heart of the uh, pros and cons of some of these titles. And some of them are extremely critical, myself, very critical of some of the uh, skeptical books that have been written that don't do, that don't offer good scholarship. So you have to be careful in choosing your titles. To okay, good to know. I, and my, another question I had, um, just because recently, you know, the, the government has come out and said that ufos and aliens yeah. this, the real evidence of this do you have an opinion on that does that relate to your research at all do you think they have evidence of a sasquatch well, or is it totally unrelated i i honestly doubt they have evidence of a sasquatch i don't put a lot of uh value in in these conspiracy theories about you know men in black and unmarked helicopters and whatnot and people showing up uh, on people's on investigators doorsteps and demanding their evidence and confiscating it i mean i've been doing this for a couple decades now no men in black have ever shown up or no no one's ever rifled my files at night while i was out of the office or anything so either i'm doing a good job of, of disseminating disinformation or it's all just a bunch of of hooey i think that the pattern of the recent shift in position towards uh ufos has is is interesting i don't anticipate the same kind of thing happening with sasquatch because i think the difference the reason it's happened with uaps now is the perception and acknowledgement of the possibility of a threat to national security that these technologies may exist and whether they're extraterrestrial or foreign um, uh, versus domestic that that remains to be seen but the fact that there are things that can fly circles around our most sophisticated fighter jets is is disconcerting and that show up at, at key installations and at, and at key events and uh both on earth and in space <laughs> that's disconcerting sasquatch doesn't rise to that level of a national security threat um, other than maybe to the logging industry. And so, uh, as some some perceive, I don't think it is even that. But uh, until that happens, I don't think we'll see a, a repeat for Sasquatch as we've seen with the congressional hearings on UAPs and UFOs and so forth. Yeah, well, and he and Sasquatch wouldn't, I mean, he, he wouldn't be an extraterrestrial or have a UFO, no. but is it possible, I mean, this was like, this is a little out there, but is it possible that he's an interdimensional being that he can... Uh, and that's why people can't find him is because he's going in through different dimensions. Yeah. Well, as a, as a scientist, you know, I've learned to say, to, to never say never. 
I'm not going to say, oh, no, absolutely not. I think it it's less likely. I mean, again, it boils down to show me the beef. And so uh, in that regard, all that we have are stories, are people's uh, suggestions of, I did have someone who came to my office, who came some quite distance to come and show me his photographs of portals where he he looks into this portal. And, and it was just an optical illusion. You could tell. I mean, you could see the surround. It was out in the forest and there were strong shadows and the sunlight was coming down. And he he perceived this as the opening of a portal. And then in there, back in that alcove he thought he could see sasquatches plural and you know i just looked at it and i i felt really bad he'd come all this way and to have to say i i don't see what you see i tried to be very you know diplomatic and very uh polite and letting him down well but, you, but did you think it was a real photo or do you think it was totally photoshopped no no i think it was a real photo but it was just a, okay. it was just an illusion a play okay. of the light on the light and shadows Okay. And, uh, you know, I get that every now and again. I just sat through a conversation with a person who had videos shot on a trail cam, you know, videos, and you could see and, and because they were triggered. And this happens mm -hmm. with some of the passive infrared sensors. They'll be triggered on a if it's a kind of a brisk day and the sun comes out real strongly, and you get those beams of light coming through, the difference in temperature is enough to trigger. And as the as the trees blow or as the sun moves with time, those light beams shift, and it starts taking pictures. Well, he sees changes in the position of shadows, which now become Sasquatch that are hiding behind the stumps and behind playing peekaboo behind the trees and all they are, are shadows. Hmm. I mean, you, it's any any you know um, sober person, <laughs> to be polite, uh, would uh, <clears throat> would uh, recognize that. But you know, people see what they want to see or what they expect to see all too often. Yeah, and that's why I say eyewitness testimony. You got to be even reports of footprints. I mean, I, I've learned firsthand people will say, oh, yeah, we've got footprints, you know, da, 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 da. Well, have you pictures or casts? Yes. But can I see them? Yes. Well, when you see them, there, there's no correlation with what they present you with and their oh. description of their find of the footprints and, and their appearance. Okay. Or at least their assumption, whether they describe it or not, you know, when they say they have footprints. So in your mind, you you have this vision these nice, clear, crisp footprints, they're just absolute proof. <clears throat> when you see it, there's a couple scuff marks in here and maybe the suggestion of a toe here. And <laughs> So with that very objective, very clear example, <clears throat> sorry, got a little tickle. Then you have to apply that same kind of stringency to claims of eyewitness encounters for which there is no documentation right. and you have to you have to be um you know skeptical <laughs> you have to be critical like a better word maybe critical of their claims and and because you're entirely dependent on their powers of observation their objectivity their lack of bias their lack of expectation uh, their experience in the field and the conditions under which, which the observation was made all those factors. So it's, you know, it's a challenge. Absolutely. Well, it's a fascinating topic. I keep an open mind. <clears throat> I'd love to see hard evidence at some point, hopefully in my lifetime. I am a Seahawks fan. I never thought the Seahawks would win a Super Bowl in my lifetime. So who knows if we'll find evidence of a Sasquatch in our there lifetime. You go. There you go. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Anything else you want to promote? No, that's that's great. I mean, uh, the the, the uh, book Sasquatch Legend Meet Science, yeah, can be had on Amazon. That's a great primer. At some yeah. point, it's. I'm glad you listened to it, but at some point, um, get a hold of a copy because the uh, the uh, audio book doesn't have the 150 figures. Oh, you've got the picture. See, that's what I thought. I was listening to it. Like, well, I need to see these yeah. pictures and things he's talking. Um, okay, I need to get the physical copy. You're right. I'm there. I'm a very visual teacher yeah. and, learner, and so it's replete. There's hardly a page you turn that doesn't have some diagram or okay. something or some photo. 
and I went to great efforts to make them very uh, high quality. Okay, I will get the physical copy then. That'll be much better. Yeah, great, great stuff. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Okay, absolutely. All right, bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.